Hi everyone, welcome back. In this video, we will start our discussion on titrations and pH curves. So I'll give an introduction and then I'll work an example of a strong acid, strong base titration. In the following video, I will work an example of a weak acid, strong base titration. So why do we need acid-base titrations? Well, it allows us to identify an unknown concentration. So you could have a basic or acidic solution of unknown concentration. And that reacts with an acidic or basic solution of known concentration. So, for example, if you look at the titration below, what's in your Erlenmeyer flask here is the unknown. And it could be acidic or basic. In this case, it's acidic. So we see the protons in solution. So therefore, you need to titrate with your basic compound of known concentration. Right? It just needs to be opposite. You're running an acid-base reaction, essentially. Also, the unknown is usually referred to as the analyte, what you're studying, and what's in the burette. Could be your burette. What's in your burette is known as the titrant. <clears throat> All right, there's a couple of other things before I dive into this figure a little bit more that are just useful to know. One is the equivalence point. And a lot of times you will hear people say the moles of acid equal the moles of base. And that's true. But sometimes that can be a confusing, especially when you're, th you're asking yourself, is it the base that's in the burette or is it the base that's the conjugate base being formed? There's multiple bases going on here, right? So I always like to say the equivalence point is the moles of whatever is in your beaker is equal to the moles of what's in your burette. And then that way, you know that you're using the right base and the right acid when you're doing moles of acid equals the moles of base. And we'll see that in the examples I'll work with you. In addition, at half the equivalence point, pH is equal to the pKa. That's always gonna be kind of a cool trick to know. Um, so at half the equivalence point, pH is equal to pKa. Once again, when I'm working these problems with you, this will, will show up. All right, so when we're looking at this setup here, typically, I know I always say beaker, mainly because it's easier for me to draw beakers, but you usually use an Erlenmeyer flask. And the reason why is when you're running a titration, you're swirling it at the same time if you don't have a magnetic stir um, bar, hot plate. Um, and so as we see here, we're looking for a color change. So we're like constantly swirling until that color change persists throughout. And so basically the hydroxides added in the titration, it starts to neutralize the acid in the Erlenmeyer flask or beaker. And at the equivalence point, the titration is complete. This is when we're kind of neutralized and we see that it's actually changed color. So we're gonna add something in there called an indicator. In this case here, the indicator happens to be phenolphthalein, which turns pink around pH of eight. 
And so that's when we know, okay, we've reached the equivalence point. So why does phenolphthalein change colors uh, when you change the pH of the solution? Well, it's a weakly acidic compound. And when it is in its acidic form, it's actually colorless. But when we add enough base, then it starts to change structure and it turns pink. It turns into what we call a conjugated system. And conjugated just means alternating double, single, double, single bonds. And so just like, for example, when you eat carrots, they're bright orange, and that's due to beta carotene, which is a very conjugated molecule. You're seeing the alternating double single bonds throughout, which contribute to this color. Whereas when it's in its acidic form, we see that we don't have alternating double single bonds here in the center, which breaks that conjugation. And so this here below, if we were monitoring, and this is acetic acid, this would be a weak acid strong base titration. You monitor how much of your titrant is added. In this case, we're titrating with sodium hydroxide, so that's why it says volume of base added and how the pH changes. What's inside your flask is acetic acid, so initially it's acidic, but eventually we'll get to a basic pH. When you're about halfway up your pH curve, here, your titration curve, you've reached the equivalence point. I wanna abbreviate equivalence point EQPT, okay? Now, the, the color change actually is called the end point. And so the end point hopefully indicates your equivalence point. It gives you an idea if you're not monitoring the pH, you know, with a pH meter while you're running the titration and you're just using this indicator to tell you when you're approximately around the um, equivalence point, then the the word endpoint just stands for the color change itself. A lot of times people think it's exactly the same. It's not necessarily the case. When I'm working with students in the laboratory, a lot of times they'll get like the bright fuchsia color and I always tell them, oh, you know, you've reached an endpoint, you've stopped your titration, but it's a little past the true equivalence point here. And so that introduces a, a certain amount of error into their titrations. Now, there are lots of different indicators out there, and it really depends on what you're studying, what your analyte is. But you always want to choose an indicator where the color change happens around the equivalence point. So a lot of times in the laboratory for general chemistry students, we titrate acetic acid, we titrate vinegar, right, with sodium hydroxide. So phenolphthalein is the indicator of choice. Because you'll notice the equivalence point here is always between around 8 to 9. And you see that the color change for phenolphthalein is the same, right, between 8 to 9. So that's why that's most commonly used in general chemistry laboratories. That's not to say that you couldn't use these other indicators um, if your equivalence point was lower than that. All right, let's work an example. So we have a 20 milliliter sample of nitric acid and it's titrated with 0 0.150 molar sodium hydroxide. Calculate the pH for at least five different points on the titration curve and sketch the curve. Indicate the volume at the equivalence point on your graph. And so I'm a big believer in drawing things out. Um, so if you do a titration problem, I highly suggest that you draw up your RET and you know draw a beaker if you feel comfortable drawing early Meyer flask that's cool so <clears throat> first want to identify what's going on in our experiment like try to visualize it um, so that it, you know everything's making sense so we have nitric acid is titrated with sodium hydroxide so when you hear that vocabulary that nitric acid's titrated that means nitric acid's in our beaker it's the analyte that's being studied and it's titrated with 
sodium hydroxide. So sodium hydroxide must be in the burette. Now, in this question here, I'm telling you to look for le at least five different points on a titration curve. Um, I would obviously on an assessment let you know, um, calculate the pH when you've added five mils of sodium hydroxide. Um, but for right now, I'm just working this problem together, I'll choose some points um, so that we can get a nice titration curve to sketch. Okay, so the first point always will be the initial pH. What's in your beaker? So what's in my beaker before we've added any sodium hydroxide, the initial pH. And basically when you ask what's in my beaker, it's always like that's the pH you're calculating. You don't care what's in your beer, right? You care what's in your beaker <clears throat> before addition and after addition. So here, what's in my beaker is a strong acid. It's nitric acid. And we've learned that to calculate the um, pH of a strong acid, it completely dissociates in solution. So the concentration of the strong acid is actually equal to the concentration of the hydronium ions in solution, which in this case is 0.125 molar. And then pH is equal to the negative log of the hydronium ion concentration, 0.125, and that is 0 0.903. Just as a side note here, no rice table is needed. for a strong acid. That will be different in our next video when I do a weak acid strong base titration. You always ask yourself, does this make sense? 0 0.903. What I have in my beaker is a strong acid, so yes, you should expect a very acidic solution, less than seven. All right. So let's calculate the pH after five milliliters of sodium hydroxide added. Okay, so I want you to imagine that you're adding that base into your beaker and a reaction is going to take place, an acid-base reaction. So we have to predict the products of this acid-base reaction here. So sodium hydroxide is the base plus nitric acid And whenever we do this one, this is not going to be the net ionic equation here. The net ionic equation would look different, and we'll talk about that at the very end of this video. Um, but basically, when we have the hydroxide here as the base, it's going to accept a proton. So one, one of the products you have is water. And this is essentially a double replacement reaction, where then the sodium cation reacts with the nitrate anion. So the other product is sodium nitrate. So essentially this acid base, strong acid, strong base titration is a double replacement reaction. Now this is not, once again, not the net ionic equation, I'm including the sodium nitrate though, even though the sodium and the nitrates are spectator ions, um, just so you understand that that is forming in solution, but it doesn't affect the pH. We learned in a previous video when studying the acid-base properties of salts that this particular salt is pH neutral. Sodium cation is the counter ion to a strong base, 
sodium hydroxide, so it's pH neutral, and nitrate is the conjugate base of a strong acid, the nitric acid, so it's also pH neutral. Let me make that a little nicer. All right, so whenever we want to calculate what's in, you know, the pH, we want to calculate the pH of what's in our beaker, okay, after the reaction's taken place. So we need to do some stoichiometry. And similar to what we've done before in the buffer videos, we will need to use a BA table to help us out here. And remember with the BAW table, we must work in moles. So therefore, I need to figure out how many moles of base I'm adding. I'm adding five milliliters of base, um, and it's a 0 0.150 molar sodium hydroxide solution. I also need to know how many moles of nitric acid I started with. So let's go ahead and do that calculation for nitric acid. So we had 0 0.0200 liters of nitric acid in our beaker with a concentration of 0.125 moles per liter. And that gives you 0 0.00 250 moles of nitric acid. And so that's what's in my beaker before the addition. That's what you're going to plug in here. I don't care about water, but sodium hydroxide, we didn't add anything before addition. So we're going to say that that's zero moles. And same thing with sodium nitrate. We didn't add anything before addition. Now, the first letter A in the BA table means addition. So we are adding sodium hydroxide from our burette um, into our beaker that contains the nitric acid here. And so how many moles are we adding? We'll have to calculate that. So we have a point. Point zero zero five liters of sodium hydroxide that was being added and converting the milliliters into liters by dividing that by a thousand. It's a point one five zero molar concentration of sodium hydroxide. And so you're adding 7.5 times 10 to the negative fourth moles of sodium hydroxide. Now remember, everything is one to one in this reaction here, in this acid-base reaction, and we have to understand that when the base is added, it wants to react with the nitric acid. So you always ask yourself what your limiting reactant is. Well, the limiting reactant here is sodium hydroxide because it's fewer moles than what we start with with our nitric acid. So once we add our sodium hydroxide, it begins reacting we want to subtract out that number of moles from that acid due to the reaction. And then after that addition, we're left with zero amount of moles of sodium hydroxide in our beaker because it was completely consumed being the limiting reactant. We're left with 0 0.00175 moles of nitric acid, remember we just ignore water,
But as we were reacting the sodium hydroxide with nitric acid, we were creating sodium nitrate as well. And so we're adding that many moles of sodium nitrate that are being created upon reaction. And there you go. So we want to calculate the pH after five mils of sodium hydroxide is added. And this is where you pause and you ask yourself, what's in my beaker after this all happens? Well, it looks like I have a nitric acid, which is a strong acid. Definitely going to contribute to the pH of the solution. And I'm also left with sodium nitrate, which is pH neutral. Therefore, I don't need to worry about sodium nitrate at all, right? It's not going to affect the pH. It's good to know it's in there, right? But it doesn't affect the pH at all. What I want to focus on is that I have 0 0.00175 moles of nitric acid left over after I've added five mils of sodium hydroxide, after that reaction has taken place. Now we know when we need to calculate the pH of a strong acid solution, it's equal to the concentration of that strong acid. So what you need to do here is you need to convert the moles into molarity. And so it's always, always important to calculate the total volume of solution. So we had started out with 20 milliliters of nitric acid. We've add five milliliters. So the total volume in our beaker after addition is 25 milliliters. Or since we're doing molarity, it is 0 0.025 liters. So when calculating the concentration of nitric acid, we put the moles of the nitric acid left over after addition divided by the total volume and you get 0 0.0 seven zero molarity. This is also equal because it's a strong acid to the hydronium ion concentration. So pH is equal to the negative log 0 0.070 which is 1.15. If you ask yourself does this make sense? based on the starting pH. So I've added sodium hydroxide. Initially my pH was 0 0.903 and now it has slightly increased after adding more base. Yeah, that should make that should make sense. All right. So let's calculate the pH after 10 milliliters of base is added. So we know the sodium hydroxide's in our burette, the nitric acid's in our beaker. If we're adding the strong base to the strong acid, a reaction is taking place. And so we must do a BA table first to figure out what's left over after the addition. So let's write our reaction again. We 
we're doing a bod table, so we need to work in moles. We calculated that what we started before any addition of nitric acid, we started with 0 0.00250 moles of nitric acid, zero amount of the sodium nitrate and the sodium hydroxide. Now we've added 10 milliliters of sodium hydroxide, so we need to figure out how many moles of that we're adding into our beaker. So we take 0 0.010 liters of nitric acid times the concentration and you get 0 0.0015 moles that you're adding from your burette, burette to your beaker. So that's the addition, and when you get to this part here, you ask yourself, which one's my limiting reactant, which will be completely consumed? And it looks like sodium hydroxide at this point in the titration is still the limiting reactant. So it will react with the nitric acid. It appears that we'll have nitric acid left over as our excess reactant, but we'll have zero amount of sodium hydroxide left over because it's been completely reacted with the strong acid. So, so we subtract out that many moles after reaction we're left with nothing of our limiting reactant the sodium hydroxide we have 0 0.0010 moles of the strong acid and remember as you're doing this reaction you're creating sodium nitrate so at this point you always ask yourself what's in my beaker and we have nitric acid which is a strong acid and sodium nitrate which is pH neutral so we will base our calculation of pH on nitric acid but when we do that we need to convert it to concentration right now we're in moles we need to figure out what our total volume is so our total volume is the 20 milliliters we initially started within our beaker of the nitric acid plus the 10 milliliters of the sodium hydroxide we've added so it's 30 milliliters but we need to convert that to liters so divide by a thousand 0 0.03 liters so the concentration of nitric acid is equal to the 0 0.0010 moles divided by 0 0.0300 liters and that would give you 0 0.03333 molar which is also equal to the hydronium ion concentration since it's a strong acid and therefore the pH is equal to the negative log of the hydronium ion concentration it's, it's a repeating <laughs> threes there um, and therefore it's 1.48 <clears throat> so after adding 10 milliliters of sodium hydroxide we're still only left with the strong acid in our beaker and the pH neutral sodium nitrate salt um, but because we have a strong acid in our beaker our pH is still relatively acidic here and you can compare that to the previous pH we calculated 1.15 it is higher than that so it should make sense we've added more base the pH is slowly increasing here all right so the next one I wanted to do is calculating the pH um, and the volume of sodium hydroxide at the equivalence point. 
Remember the equivalence point is when the moles of what's in your beaker is equal to the moles of what you're adding from your burette. So we're like the moles of what's in our beaker is equal to what we're titrating with. Okay, so we still wanna do a baud table just to illustrate this. So I'm gonna write down the reaction. So before addition, we have 0 0.00250 moles of the nitric acid in our beaker, but we have a zero amount of sodium hydroxide and sodium nitrate. Now, the purpose of the equivalence point is that whatever we're titrating with in our burette sodium hydroxide the number of moles is equal to the number of moles of what's in our beaker. And so we need to add point We're adding point zero zero two five zero moles, which reacts with our acid so that's why we subtract it out here during the addition step and so after the addition they react with each other there's no limiting reactant here right they completely consume one another so after you know you've added the base at the equivalence point you should have zero moles of both species left over we don't just have water in the solution, though we have sodium nitrate, so we're creating that at the same time. So you ask yourself, what's in my beaker? Well, you have sodium nitrate which is pH neutral. And therefore the pH of the solution, you have sodium nitrate and water, what's what the pH of your solution then is here is seven. That's why you may hear that the pH of a strong acid, so if we were looking at a strong acid, strong base titration, the pH at the equivalence point is equal to seven. This is for a strong acid, strong base titration only. If you have a weak acid, strong base titration, the pH at the equivalence point will not be seven. And if you have a weak base, strong acid titration, the pH at the equivalence point will not be seven. So just so you know, this is only for strong acid, strong base. And that's where the net ionic equation may come into play to remind you if you ever you know, like, oh, I remember there's a trick to this one. If you think of the net ionic equation, basically ignoring sodium and nitrate, you're left with this equation here, where the hydroxide plus the, the proton gives you water. What's really going on is that it's the hydroxide plus the hydronium ion 
gives you water. So the fact that all you really have left in solution based on the net ionic equations water is a good reminder that this is pH neutral. Now we also need to figure out the volume that we need it to add and I'll do that up here. The volume of sodium hydroxide that's needed to add at the equivalence point so we can plot it on our titration curve in a minute. And so when we look at this here we have the number of moles that are added, 0 0.00250 moles of sodium hydroxide. We know the concentration So it's going to be 0 0.0167 liters, which is 16.7 milliliters. So basically, when it comes to figuring out the volume you need to add at the equivalence point, you're working backwards here. You know at the equivalence point what the moles you need to add here. And so from that, using the concentration of whatever is in your burette, you can figure out the volume that's needed to add. So we need to add 16.7 milliliters of sodium hydroxide to reach the equivalence point for this titration. All right, let's go past the equivalence point. Let's calculate the pH. Okay. After 25 milliliters of sodium hydroxide is added. So our equivalence point was 16.7. Now we're adding 25 milliliters. Once again, we got to write down what's happening in our beaker, the reaction, and do a baud table first. So let's write down that reaction. So working in moles for that baud table, because it's just stoichiometry here. We initially in our beaker, always start with what you initially put in before addition. So 0 0.00250 moles of nitric acid, zero amount of the sodium hydroxide and sodium nitrate. Then we're adding 25 milliliters of the sodium hydroxide, so we need to figure out how many moles that is. So we're adding 0 0.00375 moles of sodium hydroxide from your burette. And so now you ask yourself, what is my limiting reactant? And when you're past the equivalence point, it looks like the nitric acid is your limiting reactant because you have fewer moles. So therefore, it will be completely consumed at the end of, you know, adding 25 milliliters of sodium hydroxide. So we will subtract out 0 0.00250 moles. Now, therefore, sodium hydroxide is the excess reactant, so we will have some of this left over. We've added 0 0.00375 moles. 0 0.0025 of those moles were consumed and reacted with nitric acid. So you want to take this number, subtract out this number here, in order to get what's left over in excess. And in this case here, it's 0.00125 moles of sodium hydroxide. <clears throat> now we're always recreating sodium nitrate, so 0 0.00250 moles. Once we run out of that limiting reactant, we can't make more than that. 
it's pH neutral, so we're not too concerned about sodium nitrate, but it's good to know what's in my beaker. All right, so let's ask that question. What's in my beaker? Well, what's in my beaker at the end of it all is sodium hydroxide and sodium nitrate. Sodium hydroxide is a what? Good, it's a strong base. Sodium nitrate is pH neutral. And so we've learned that to calculate the pH of a strong base, we understand that the concentration of sodium hydroxide is equal to the concentration of the hydroxide ions in solution. So we need to first convert moles of sodium hydroxide into the um, concentration. So we need to calculate the total volume. Remember, we started with 20 milliliters. We've added 25 milliliters of sodium hydroxide, so our beaker has a total volume right now of 45 milliliters or 0 0.045 liters by dividing by 1,000. So therefore, our concentration of sodium hydroxide is equal to 0 0.00125 moles divided by 0 0.0450 liters, and that's equal to 0 0.0277 molar. And because it's a strong base, that's also equal to our hydroxide ion concentration. It's a one-to-one -one ratio, by the way, of sodium hydroxide to hydroxide. And therefore, our pOH is equal to the negative log of the hydroxide ion concentration one point five six. Our pH is equal to fourteen minus the pOH, which is equal to twelve point four four. And there you go. So you ask yourself, does this make sense based on what's in my beaker? What's in my beaker is a strong base. And so yes, we do expect to see a basic pH here. All right, the last step is to sketch the pH curve. That is not a straight line. <laughs> okay, so on pH curve, you have pH on the y-axis, and you have the volume of your titrant added. In this case, whatever's in your burette, sodium hydroxide add it in milliliters and I'll just go in increments of two All right, so let's go back, look at our data that we've already calculated here. So at the initial pH, right, when zero amount of base has been added, we have 0 0.903. After we've added five milliliters, we are at 1.15. So let's go ahead and plot those. So zero point Nine three at zero volume of sodium hydroxide added, and then for the five mils, 
for slightly above that. For 10 milliliters, we calculated a pH of 1.48. I know I'm kind of right at two right now, but you can imagine, <laughs> 1.48. And then we calculated the equivalence point, which was at 16.7 milliliters, and that was a pH of seven. So you can see it kind of shoot up there. So I'm looking at around 16.7, and then I wanna go up here to mark the equivalence point at seven. And then we calculated at 25 milliliters that the pH went to about 12.44. And so when you're doing, when your analyte is an acid, this goes for weak acids as well, your curve will have almost like a positive slope S curve, if you can, if you want to call it that. So what it will look like is you initially have acidic pH and then it'll shoot up, it's almost like a sneak, and then look like this. So anytime your analyte, what's in your beaker is an acid, your curve will always look like this. It'll kind of change shape in terms of like where your equivalence point is located, etc. But it always kind of would be like a positive, um, like an S, right? Now, if you have a strong base in your beaker or a weak base, then it'll be the reverse, where you start with high pH and then you come down to acidic. <coughs> and so something to <coughs> excuse me. Something to make note of is that um, the equivalence point is here. And it's usually always halfway up the vertical part of the pH curve. So here it just happened to be seven because we did a strong acid, strong base titration, but it may, it's gonna definitely change if we have a weak acid or a weak base in our beaker that we're titrating, but it's usually always halfway up this uh, vertical portion of the pH curve. Remember the equivalence point's not necessarily equal to the end point. The end point is when you're in the lab and the indicator changes color and gives you an idea of where your equivalence point would be um, when you've reached it. And remember equivalence point is when the moles of what's in your beaker is equal to the moles of what you're adding in your from your burette. So moles of analyte equals the moles of titrant. Um, and yeah, so this was an example of a strong acid, strong base. There's a lot to it, right? So I highly encourage you after watching this video to go through this example again without looking at my work because I know when I work through it, sometimes students say, oh, when you do it, it just makes sense. But then when I do it, it can get quite challenging, right? And you might get stuck. So work through this again on your own. Talk yourself through each step of the way, just like I have taught you. Pretend like you're teaching to someone else and say it in your own words. Um, and like I said, always like ask yourself, like, how do I get this number here? How do I calculate moles here? And then that way you can utilize those skills for any titration here onwards. So thank you all for watching and I will see you next time.